Located west of the Public Garden is Boston's Back Bay. Back in the days of Sam Adams and Paul Revere, this area was little more than a muck-filled estuary along the Charles River. However, thanks to one of those handy land reclamation projects that we mentioned in the last section, the Back Bay was filled in in the 19th century and voila, one of the city's most exclusive neighborhoods was born. The main shopping thoroughfare here is Newbury Street, which is practically synonymous with high fashion and style. Filling the retail space here in these converted townhouses are both national chains and one-of-a-kind designer boutiques. Numerous restaurants and cafes line the street as well, giving shoppers ample opportunity to let the credit card cool off a bit between purchases. Beyond the shopping, the Back Bay has plenty to offer to sightseers as well. Within a block of Newbury Street are some of the city's most famous buildings. Just to the north is the First Baptist Church, one of Boston's seemingly endless supply of distinctive churches. Two blocks to the south lies Copley Square. On one side of the square is the Boston Public Library, which was the first library in the United States that was totally free and open to the entire public. And right across the street is the oddly, if accurately named, New Old South Church. On the other side of Copley Square is Trinity Church, a true architectural masterpiece. This massive building dates from 1877 and was designed by Henry Hobson Richardson, the architect also responsible for the First Baptist Church a few blocks away. With its intricately detailed porticos and bell tower, Trinity Church is one of the most beautiful buildings in all of Boston, and probably the jewel in the crown of the entire Back Bay. Continuing Boston's uncanny knack for mixing the old with the new, the Back Bay is home to the city's two tallest skyscrapers. Right near Trinity Church is the 740-foot John Hancock Tower, which has been the tallest building in all of New England since 1976. And a couple of blocks away is the 52-story Prudential Center, which has a restaurant on the top floor that has some of the most spectacular views in the entire city. The Pru, as it's sometimes known, overlooks the ornate Christian Science Center, which is the headquarters of the Worldwide Church. This denomination was founded by Mary Baker Eddy right here in New England in the late 19th century, and this huge complex has grown to occupy 14 acres of Back Bay real estate. The center's main basilica alone can accommodate up to 5,000 worshippers, and the 700-foot-long reflecting pool outside has become one of the best spots in the entire city for a brown bag lunch or a mid-afternoon stroll. One of the hottest tickets in town is right across Massachusetts Avenue, Symphony Hall, the home of the world-famous Boston Symphony Orchestra. Since its inception in 1881, this ensemble has set the bar for classical music in this town very high indeed. Since 2004, the BSO has been under the baton of James Levine, the first American-born conductor ever to lead the orchestra. Together with its sister orchestra, the Boston Pops, the BSO performs to over a million people annually. If you happen to visit Boston in the summer, you'll find the orchestra about two hours away in residence at Tanglewood. But even if you can't make the drive, not to worry. Back in Boston, the Pops Orchestra gives numerous free summer concerts on the Charles River Esplanade, including their 4th of July spectacular that never fails to bring out the Patriot even in the most cynical Bostonian. The Boston Symphony Orchestra is just one of the cultural treasures in this part of town. To the east of Symphony Hall is the Theatre District, home to numerous performing arts venues, including the Schubert Theatre, which hosts the Boston Lyric Opera. The nearby Wang Theatre, with a capacity of nearly 4,000. And the Opera House, whose striking Baroque facade is hard to miss. Not far from all these theaters is another of Boston's lively ethnic enclaves, Chinatown. Though the inevitable gentrification has changed the area a bit, it still retains much of its immigrant flavor. Some visitors are surprised to learn that the Chinese community here is so substantial. In fact, after New York and San Francisco, this district is the third largest Chinese neighborhood in the entire country. And if the pasta over in the North End isn't quite what you're after, there are sure to be plenty of restaurants in this neighborhood that will be more than happy to lay out the chopsticks for you. 
Now, just about five miles south of Chinatown is Franklin Park, the largest public park in the city and home to the Franklin Park Zoo. This 72-acre animal park has been in operation for nearly 100 years and is the largest zoo in all of New England. Franklin Park itself is the final link in Boston's so-called Emerald Necklace, a chain of green spaces that runs through this part of the city. Highlights here at the zoo include a white tiger that was rescued from black marketers in 2006 and a realistically designed tropical habitat that is home to the zoo's popular lowland gorillas. There are also several mixed species exhibits here at the zoo and even an enclosure containing as many as 1,000 different butterflies. True, it is a bit of a drive from some of the other attractions in Boston, but for a family-friendly outing on a beautiful summer day, the Franklin Park Zoo is the perfect place to hang around. Follow the Emerald Necklace back toward the Charles River for a few miles, and you'll arrive at an area known as the Back Bay Fens, and around here are two of the finest museums in the entire city. First up is the Isabella Stort Gardner Museum. This museum's namesake was an independent-minded New Yorker that came to Boston after marrying local bigwig Jack Gardner in 1860. When she wasn't busy scandalizing polite Boston society, Mrs. Jack, as she was known around town, went about the business of amassing this remarkable collection of European and American art to decorate their home. After her husband's death around the turn of the century, Mrs. Jack began to build this Venetian-style palazzo, complete with an enclosed courtyard. She lived here at what she called Fenway Court until 1924, when she died at the age of 84. Mrs. Jack's will at the time stipulated that the collection not be altered in any way. So here it lies, frozen in time, a monument to the will, tastes, and eccentricities of its collector. Though a notorious art theft in 1990 robbed the museum of over $200 million worth of classic paintings, the Gardner Museum remains one of the finest private collections in the entire country, in a true highlight on this side of town. Less than half a mile away is our next treasure trove for art lovers, the Museum of Fine Arts. This massive museum moved here from its original location in Copley Square back in 1909, just as the Fenway was starting to attract high-class residents like Mrs. Gardner down the street. In the 1920s, the MFA added this breathtaking rotunda, which was one of the final works of noted American artist John Singer Sargent. Connected to the rotunda are a series of some of the most eclectic and fascinating galleries to be found anywhere. Antiquity aficionados will find a wealth of ancient works on display, including an entire hall devoted to the art of Asia and another to the works of ancient Egypt. Visitors to the museum's Russell Gallery, on the other hand, will get a chance to see civil work cast by our old friend Paul Revere, as well as portraits of heroes of the American Revolution, many done by America's premier colonial artist, Boston's own John Singleton Copley. And no visit to the museum would be complete without taking in its large collection of Impressionist and Post-Impressionist paintings, which is, well, impressive. Now, the word must-see is certainly thrown around a lot in travel guides, but if it were ever appropriate, now would be the time. For art lovers, the Museum of Fine Arts is simply not to be missed. Okay, sports fans, you can wake up now. We've arrived. We couldn't very well visit the fans without visiting Fenway Park now, could we? Built in 1912, Fenway is the oldest ballpark in the major leagues. Over the years, fans have turned out by the millions to support their favorites, from old-school heroes like Williams and Yastrzemski to more modern legends like Schilling, Ramirez, and Ortiz. True, we had a bit of a dry spell there in the 20th century, namely most of it, but things in the new millennium are definitely looking up, and for once, being a Red Sox fan is not quite so painful. It'll take some getting used to, but believe me, we're working on it. <laughs> 